Hello and welcome back once again, as always, on a weekly basis to the to the do. Gonna do that one more time because I almost said Nintendo. And that, that's the old show. We're gonna go back. <laughs> Sorry, guys. It's been a long day. <laughs> In five, four, three, two, one. So professional. Hello and welcome back once again, as always. On a weekly basis, it's me, Andy, and this is the Dual Screens Podcast, the world's number one indie dev interview podcast, probably, most definitely, I want to say. And joining me this week are two awesome dudes, Alex Bezushka and Eric Lathrop, developers of KickBot, a two-button platformer where you can't walk but you only wall jump. Guys, welcome to the show. How's it going? Good, I'm glad to be here. Yeah, thanks for having us. Yeah, I'm noticing as we're chatting that my camera is frozen in the most <laughs> inopportune. <laughs> Just screenshot that for later. Yeah, that's going to be, well, now it's being recorded forever, so it's going to live <laughs> somewhere on the old hard drive. Um, that is a very unfortunate picture, and it's staring me right into my soul <laughs> it's really horrifying I um, we were the ones with the internet problem i know but i guess i guess it's me i guess it's basically i bought new shit and now it fails that's what happens you guys you know i trusted newer better tech and it failed me already on on the outset but it's okay i evolve i move past it so speaking about evolving you guys are evolving what a platformer should be with this game and i think for my initial icebreaker question to either one of you alex or eric um who hurt you (laughs) (laughs) there there's some streamers when they're playing the demo they or the beta where they ask like who made this level i know it was one of the two of you which one was it which one should i be angry at (laughs) <laughs> and i'll say yeah that one was eric it's his fault <laughs> sorry yeah i usually i usually i usually ask folks when the game is kicking my ass you know from here to next sunday why why do you hate me for making a game like this but i want to see i feel like i want to dig deeper and ask what possesses someone to create a game that is so punishing but yet i don't want to put it down there's only two buttons. How hard could it possibly be? Oh, you you say that. <laughs> like even a baby can play. It's that easy. It's just two little buttons. It's, you know, <laughs> we are the most accessible game ever made. Yeah. <laughs> there was a there was a guy playing it with one hand on a stream the other day. <laughs> but um he's still dying all the time though. But yeah, um I actually kind of think about it a different way like if you was like so kickbot is a retro inspired game mm-hmm. but when i go back and play retro games that i grew up with and that i love i find them to be really punishing and brutal and unforgiving with like lives and continues and bad checkpoint placement or no checkpoints and all that kind of stuff and like our game we try to make it more fair where it's like you can mess up and then try again at that part that you messed up at immediately and uh so i would say that we're actually less punishing than than a lot of platformers but um you know it's the it's the try and fail and learn and try again kind of thing right less punishing up until you see the rank it gives you and i'm (laughs) I'm trying i'm trying to make that break that d rank guys it's just it is not happening for me it just makes it all the more satisfying when you finally get the S rank. Kickbot is really a game about self improvement. Sure, let's go with that. So <laughs> it's also a, a swears generator. Mm-hmm, for so sure. That's, yeah, and we're recording all those swears for later use. Oh, that's like <laughs> that's like the best supercut you're gonna have on your hands when the time comes. That is that is like the launch trailer. Is just a bunch of streamers cursing like drunk sailors <laughs> yeah i i have i have a lot of those i want to put it all together it just takes a lot of time but that would be amazing 
now without going into too much detail, do you ever hear a curse that catches you off guard? Like, oh, that's a new one. Or like a, just uh, a, a certain turn of phrase where it's like, oh, I never heard the term twat waffle before. I mean, like, <laughs> <laughs> I, there have been a couple of British British streamers lately, oh, fun, but I can't yeah. I can't think of like I can't think of things off the top of my head that they said. But it mm-hmm. was it was just fun to to hear the different words that people use. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and then and then we've had streamers who played in Spanish or in Portuguese, or we recently <laughs> had someone in Japanese, and I I don't know what they're saying, but it's really fun to watch and. You get the emotion, but you don't you might not know what they're saying, but you can understand what's happening. Well, frustration so is a universal language, so I feel. Yeah. <laughs> well, let, let, let's keep on this beat. So, what's it like for you watching people? Because this is a, this this kind of game, I think, lends itself well to streamer culture because it's very rapid fire, and people that are watching are reveling in the player's failure and also <laughs> in their success when they finally figure out how to figure out a certain room like what the jump pattern is and after about 20 deaths and they finally succeed it's like everyone goes crazy so when when you're watching that unfold what is that like for you guys as developers of this game right it's a it's a ton of fun i mean i get a i get a lot of uh for better or worse i get a lot of my (laughs) self-worth as a game developer out of uh out of uh, seeing people enjoy things that I've made and getting feedback. So I love it. Um, it's, it's interesting too. Like we get a lot of feedback and we get a lot of uh, like, we've made a lot of improvements to the game and added stuff to it because of streamers. So like uh, two things off the top of my head is the death counter. That's always visible. That counts your total deaths from, from all time. Uh, that was a request by a streamer because they wanted their audience to be able to like, give them crap about it while they're playing mm-hmm. uh because while they're down mm-hmm. yeah and then the um custom trails which is coming out in the next version where you can change the color of your of kickbots visor and the trail color that comes out when you do your double jump and your butt stomp uh so that's kind of cool like streamers want to be able to match their color scheme with their with the rest of their their streamer stuff so i think people are gonna like that so but, I- um it's just fun. <laughs> yeah, I mean, listen, like I was playing it before we hopped on this interview and my fiance was just laughing at me failing. And I was like, if you, if you laugh one more time. <laughs> <laughs> the couch is not that comfortable. <laughs> but um, it's really rewarding, like watching people play it, though. And like, it's fun to see people have fun. You know, it's like we spent a lot of time working on this game. And it's, it's great when you see someone who's never seen this game before, just start playing it. And then they like understand it. And it's like, I'm communicating things through this piece of software that they downloaded, you know, and it's so cool. Do you and find like, you- like the level design too, you yeah. know, like when they like figure out some jump or, you know, they do something that you didn't expect. It's, it's just so cool. That's uh- a, that's a great point too. Like there are, there are a bunch of paths through these levels that we've never done because we, we made it to work in a certain way. And we might've even thought that that was the only way, but then people come up with other paths and that's super fun to see. And then we want to, cater the game towards that instead of instead of making it like you can only do this one way i would rather have people come up with all kinds of cool paths to get through levels shortcuts and stuff right and on that note of level design do you guys find yourselves uh slightly informed on the design side while watching folks play maybe you say a chunk of the audience of the players are struggling at this one level should we adjust for that or this seems too easy for people to make it more difficult or just do you say, you know what, we trust our design, let them keep failing and then they'll get it at some point eventually. Uh, we've definitely made changes based mm-hmm. on yeah, watching people. I, I, we we're do constantly testing it and watching people and, you know, people have found mm-hmm. ways to like skip all of the hard parts of a room and, you know, like, <laughs> They just go into it and go bloop, and you're like, oh, dang, I didn't know you could do that. Yeah. They skipped ev- everything. So you have to put a bunch of saws or spikes there, you know, to stop them. 
Wow, yeah. what, what an asshole. <laughs> it's like, oh, look how, look how clever you were. I was going to take that right away from you. <laughs> Sometimes. If it's a really easy to discover shortcut, then we might get rid of it. But if it's a, if it's a really tricky to pull off one, like there's somewhere you have to like jump super fast to squeeze through little places and stuff. And if they if they have the skill to do something that I can't even pull off, then whatever, that they get it. It's fine. But um, but the other thing, like we've been on a show floor at like showing off the game at an expo before and seen people dying or having a lot of trouble in a place that we totally didn't mean to be a challenge. And then we have to go and adjust it. And the interesting part is sometimes when people have trouble in an area and they keep dying in a certain area because they're do not doing what we intended, mm. sometimes the answer is actually adding more spikes instead of taking them away. <laughs> And then it forces them to not jump on that wall, but jump on the other wall instead. Uh, so I see. There's a, there's a yeah, ton sometimes of, they have too many options. We yeah, have to take some right. options away. So we're adjusting all the time. And we have, so like we have 14 levels in the demo and those levels are pretty well refined now because so many people played them. But then we also have a beta where we have some people in our discord who are playing through like 80 levels that we have done. And mm -hmm. so we're, yeah, we need to make sure that all the levels are played a lot before we launch the game to find any possible weird stuff because we're not we're not like this is the first game where we've actually done level design. So we want to make sure that we get it right. We don't want to just make it, you know, come up with something and put it out there and, and have it be crappy. We'd much rather trial and error everything. Right. For me, sometimes the most basic solutions i couldn't get past like there was one section i think towards the end of the demo where you have to like pick up the little boost pill thing like in succession going up like with spikes on either side of you and i could not get that timing right to just pick up and go like the left right button press i was like what am i doing wrong i've like semi sailed through this entire demo and this where i have I know the solution. I know what I'm, I have to do to win, but I just couldn't get it. It, 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 it drove me insane. That one's pretty tough. <laughs> In the, um, the interesting thing about the demo is that we didn't just take the first, like the first 14 levels of the game. We took a couple levels from each world and the seven worlds in the game are all, you know, like they're, they get harder as you go along. And so, um, every couple levels where the art changes in the demo is is the next world so the one that you're talking about is in world three mm -hmm. so so the game will have ramped up quite a bit in difficulty by the time you get to world three and there probably will be a level or two that have a similar mechanic to that before that one that kind of ease you into it a little more but that one is tough the time that one is really all about timing yeah that's where all like the my middle school grade school like muscle memory kicks in it's 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 so deep in my fingers that's why i was so good at super meat boy up until a certain point um so gameplay aside i want to kind of kick it over to that was that was a really good pun andy <laughs> that was good this they should pay you for this job <laughs> i want to talk more about or talk about in general the uh the genesis of this of this idea uh this concept of it's a platformer, but you can't move. And it's just two buttons. Was it just, did you guys play a bunch of Mega Man X one night while you were drunk and thought, you know what's the best part about this game? The wall clinging. What if it was just that for a full game? How did this idea come to be where you're just jumping off the wall as the core mechanic? in a platformer take it all the way back to the beginning talk about the flappy jams yeah i guess um flappy jams i love this <laughs> do you remember flappy bird all the way back in 2014 uh, yeah of course um, we forget <laughs> well he was that the developer of that had uh gotten some like nasty messages on twitter or something and took his game off the stores or something mm -hmm. so a bunch of indie devs put together a Flappy Jam Game Jam to make games similar to Flappy Bird, kind of like ragey one button games or whatever. Um, and we participated in that. 
it was like a 30 day jam. And I think we found out about it on the last weekend of it. Yeah. We didn't hear we about the it game. until the very end. <laughs> we made the game in like one, one night at your apartment back then. And yeah, probably had some ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we were like, let's take um, Flappy Bird, but like turn it up, you know, like 90 degrees. Right. Oh, interesting. And, uh, you know, we have to do two buttons left and right because I mean, well, if, if it's 90 degrees, then you're like you're wall jumping and it's like, well, what games have wall jumping that we, you know, and we were thinking like Alex is a big uh, Mega Man fan and I'm a big Metroid yep. fan. Yep. So we were thinking about robots and wall jumping and um, we built this game uh, also called Kickbot back then and had a lot of people playing it for a long time and we wanted to make a new game some years later um but we didn't want it to be like the first game is just like a real simple thing and you know there's no way to like i don't know we wanted to expand on it because people mm-hmm. were playing it on like the chrome web store um we we actually built a whole kickbot game for mobile because it's the original game is vertical and it look, fits well on phones and we right did, right yeah whole, i can see that yeah a whole mobile thing where you have skins and all the the mobile monetization stuff and then we we hated ourselves yeah. basically <laughs> we said i don't want to make game i have to make a game like this and it was like 95 percent done and yeah. we said no we're gonna just delete this i still wow. pull that game up on my phone once in a while and uh we were going to call it Kickbutt DX, and uh, I, I pull that game open on my phone once in a while, and I'm like, man, this is pretty solid. Like, we were almost done with it, but I just I just want to make games that I want to play, which are games where you pay once, and then you have the game, and that's what we grew up with, and that's what we still like, and so it just felt weird for us to do something that we don't like, and so we worked on that game for like over a year and then we just scrapped it and started over from scratch. <laughs> where, where did that and come it, from? Like the idea of wanting to include like a micro like was it just like, cause it was trendy at the time where you thought that was an easy way to get some that's monetization. The only way, that's the only way you can really make money on a mobile game, uh-huh. right? Is yeah. like either microtransactions or ads and they both, I mean, I hate both of those personally. Yeah. Right. Like you, I don't play phone <clears throat> games generally because I play a shitload of video games, but not phone games. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like like I like some phone I like some phone games. I I mean like, but I just we were we were kind of looking at like we we basically made like all of twenty dollars off of all our previous games combined or something like that, and so it, there was a choice of like we could put this game up for a dollar. Mm-hmm. um or we could and get 20 players or we could put it up for free and get thousands of players so we'd always make that choice of getting more players right and um the previous the, the original kickbot game which we kind of changed the name to kickbot classic now to keep it separate but mm-hmm. um it it was getting like on the chromebook um it had like it peaked around seventy thousand people had it installed Holy at one shit. point okay and um we had never made any money off of it. it had no ads it was free completely free and then um but when we saw that the stats were still rising over the years we were like maybe we should make like a sequel to this and try to get people who played the original to play a new game that we can actually charge for uh, because we'd like to make games full-time and that requires making a living <laughs> it's like how do we turn right. this simple game into a like a full meaty real thing that people would pay actual dollars for and so so we could eat yeah and so with with kickbot dx the mobile one that is never going to be released we um we were like following kind of the pattern that that uh, crossy road did because crossy road was doing really well and they had uh it was completely free but it had some monetization where you could buy stuff or get coins or whatever and it was it was okay and um, so we did a lot of that stuff. And then we just, like I said, one day we just decided, I don't like this anymore. And we scrapped it and <laughs> started over. And that's when uh, that's when we started working on the current Kickbot, um, which uh, our goal at that point was we're not going to make, 
we're not going to try to make mobile games anymore. We want we have a goal of getting on uh, Steam and consoles because those marketplaces have fewer fewer people than mobile. Fewer games are coming out uh, per week than mobile, so we have a little better chance of being seen. And the players on those platforms are okay with paying up front for a game and paying something like 20 bucks for a game and then having it and not having to pay for extra stuff. And that's the kind of games that we like. See, so we I, started working on that. Yeah, I am like not at all tapped into what the mobile gaming scene is like. And to hear you say that there's more visibility for you on the PC and console space compared to mobile, a little blows my mind. Because I feel like everywhere I look, there's like a new game that I haven't even heard of that is totally up my alley. It just pops up on Twitter. I'm like, this is this game is amazing, and I buy it. And even a game like yours, I had no idea it exists until like last week. And to hear that it's less crammed in these other spaces than the mobile market makes you wonder what the fuck is going on in the mobile gaming scene that it's so many more games are coming out with, with more consistency. It's an order of magnitude from all like the stuff we've heard. It's like a hundred or a thousand games come out every day on the different phone Jesus stores. Jesus yeah. and, Christ. And, and like on Steam, there's like 30 games come out yeah. every day. Mm-hmm. I think it, I think it some at the point where we decided to make the thing the decision to not do mobile anymore, it was something like like five hundred to fifty was the difference or something like that. It was crazy. And so I was just like, yeah, we have a way better chance. And then even uh, like the console, putting a game on consoles has been a dream since I started making games. And there are even less games coming out per week mm-hmm. on consoles than on Steam. Um, and so our idea is being in a smaller, you know, in a smaller group, it's easier to be seen, that it's easier to stand out. And importantly, uh, those other gamers pay actual dollars that i yeah. can use to buy hamburgers <laughs> you know this Whereas may be this mobile may... gamers only pay like ad impressions you know right right <laughs> what what's your go-to hamburger eric but this is like a rapid fire question but i want to ask you now what is like when when you get that fresh hot hamburger money Oh my God. Yeah, I'm gonna go to. There's a place uh, in town called Grind. I'm gonna go to for sure. Yeah, they've got great burgers. That's the top of my list too. They uh, they've got one uh, the B and B, which is like bacon and brie cheese, and uh, some kind of Man. spicy jelly. What was it? Fig jelly? Ghost or mayo. Fig uh, or jelly. Ghost, ghost. Isn't it ghost? Ghost. Uh, or no, that's what you dip your fries in. You yeah. get you get like a some sort of aioli there's pepper. some kind of like sweet jelly on top of the the cheese and bacon on this burger and it's like a brioche bun and it's like i need <laughs> to get my ass down to to lewisville kentucky as soon as possible there's we, a lot of great food we've got, i am missing got, out on some good food you guys <laughs> we've got good food here it's surprising there's, there's like a like, like a food of- college or something that it, so it pumps out <laughs> a lot of restaurant tours and because the because the cost of living is cheap and they can go to school and, and all that stuff. We were, we were just at this Cuban place that that I was at for the first time that he told me about it today, and it was it was so good. What is speaking about all your, kinds of stuff? Speaking of where you guys live and where you guys you know <clears throat> where, where your home base is and where you make amazing games. What is the what is the indie gaming scene like out there in Kentucky? Um, because you know, I, 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 we've talked a lot of developers. You know, there's a huge, thriving scene. You know, Canada, like you know, Montreal, Quebec, those parts. You know, L.A., New York, especially in in, in the states. But what's it like in Kentucky for like indie gamers, developers? What does that seem like? Is there a huge support system? Is it just you guys? <laughs> what, what does that look like out there? Um. So. It's it's not huge, but it's better than it was eight years ago mm-hmm. when we started getting into it. I think it's better than a lot of cities. So, like, uh, so to preface, we don't have any big game studios in Louisville, right? Mm-hmm. Like, it's there's no no one making games you've probably heard of in Louisville for the most part. Mm-hmm. There's no like big companies paying people to make games, so it's all indie people, hobbyists. Mm-hmm. But 
for an indie hobbyist community, our community is pretty sweet. Um, we have uh, like a meetup and like me and Alex and some of our friends started it like years and years ago. And we've been like rock solid regular, like every, like we, meeting twice a week, a month. Um, and so we have a, like a discord and all of these people making, all these hobbyists making games and we all, you know, chat and share and help each other. Um, you know, we've got a lot of people invested in the unity side of development mm-hmm. that help each other, but there's a couple of Godot people and other people doing things. Um, and we're pretty good friends with another major city down the road, Lexington, Kentucky, and we all do events together. Um, so we've got a really good support system in terms of like people helping each other. Um, and like, if, if like contract work or jobs come through, we help each other and, you know, pass, pass stuff along or that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. So eventually someone's probably going to make something that you've heard of. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I mean, compared to a lot of like cities that don't have a company, you know, with a huge popular game, like, I think we're better than most cities, you know? I feel like that's kind of a nice thing, though. Like, you're you're rock stars in your own right because it's not, there's not a huge, you know, huge scene that has, like, a, a massive AAA publisher footprint in your state. It's it's just, it's underground. It's, it's the little guys coming together and just making games out of a passion. And that's the driving force. Yeah, I mean, we've got enough people that um, we've put together a nonprofit called Louisville Makes Games. Uh, what five years ago now? I so don't know. maybe a little, maybe a little over that. And yeah, it, like it's a real nonprofit, <clears throat> and you, we can take donations and stuff. It, and we do events, and we do like little like kids classes. You know, like there's a lot of like STEM kids sure. who learn that kind of stuff, and we run those. And uh, but we have enough people where we've rented a space downtown that's yeah. basically our clubhouse that's where we are here are are, so. are, you, are you guys like actual real world angels so i'm hearing <laughs> you, you 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 watered <laughs> off temptation to like do a simple microtransaction filled mobile game like no we're not going to do this now there's like a philanthropic angle to your backstory, and I'm, I'm just—we just got some damn morals. I don't you know. do. <laughs> I mean, fuck the guy from New York is doing morals, or I'm like, oh, this is what good people look like. <laughs> uh, I mean, I mean, it's uh, it's the indie dev scene is like this. I just, I just think in general, most of the people that I've met who are indie game developers are wanting to make um, games that are not trying to take advantage of anybody. They're trying to make games that are new and different and have, have you know, want to bring joy to other people mm-hmm. more than just what is the formula to make, to crank out dollar bills. Um, I think most of the people I've met are like that. And so that's a, like, whenever I go to conferences and shows and all kinds of stuff in other states and everything and meet people and meet other people who have made games I've heard of, like people are just like that. So we just, yeah, I mean, it's what we want to do too. And everybody in the indie dev scene is really good about sharing knowledge and helping people and talking about their game ideas. And it's not like, like, technically if we talk to somebody who knows nothing about video games they would say like oh so you're like a tech startup business or something and it's like technically right it's kind of the same thing but the vibe is so different you know like if we're if we're like tech startup people they've all got you know like oh we've got our idea and we got to protect it and we got to try, try to figure out how to get an investor and then drop it off and sell it and move on to the next thing and we're like these projects are our babies and we want to we want to like nurture it and make it perfect and send it off in the world. And we want people to get joy out of it. It's, it's like a different vibe. Um, so it's something you can't get into making games. I don't think um, maybe you can, I don't know, but you can't really, in my opinion, get into making games without 
being really passionate about it because it's such a hard industry to break into. Mm -hmm. So you've got to love it or you're not going to stick with it. And it's like, we've, we've been working on games together. I mean, Eric for eight years now, and we have, like I said, <laughs> not made any money. You know, we have made enough money to get a couple go to uh, get ice cream a couple times and that's it kind of a thing. And it's like, um, this kickbot is our first big game is what we keep saying because it's the first thing where we have levels and it's not like a procedurally generated um infinite runner kind of thing like other mm -hmm. games that we've made we've made like 20 different games for game jams and like just small weekend projects that we put out um but like yeah i mean i'm hoping that this will help us get closer to making games for a living um that's uh that would be fantastic yeah like i don't want to like move to seattle and work for a big company and have a cubicle and have publishers yelling at me you know yeah. eric doesn't say it much but he got a job offer from ea at one point and he turned it down what he did i feel like that's an easy job to turn down <laughs> yeah that email a long EA time of ago all people. you were just like ah, i'm not even gonna look at them i'm not even gonna care about this <laughs> and i remember that i was like oh shit is he gonna leave me <laughs> But um, yeah, we've done some contract work stuff that's paid way more than making our own games, but it's like making apps for, for companies or whatever. It's not really like games. But, um, yeah, so we just kept the day jobs. This whole like EA thing is a little, I, 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 I kind of want to press a little bit on it because I'm wondering, is it? Well, it doesn't seem like you remember now. <laughs> I don't even remember. It. I don't know. Well, just, just... I mean, to piggyback off of that, like the idea of working for a large, a large publisher or developer is that that is not within like, you, you guys don't want that. You want to just do your own thing, be independent and just have, it's your own vision through and through. And no one else is going to get like, their hands in the pot, so to speak. Yeah. yeah. I mean, with the nice thing about, about uh, being a two-person studio is we could do whatever we want. And the nice thing about working at a big company is that we could uh, get paid. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah. It's like... You're, you're balancing want, a regular paycheck those... versus getting to do what you want. Yeah. Beef and fig jam burgers or <laughs> great creative yeah, yeah. freedom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah you have to have a paying job to get the bougie burgers like that mm -hmm. but um but uh yeah i mean there's there's uh not many opportunities for stuff like that here you'd have to move and we've had friends that have moved um and we have some friends who have gotten things remote which is cool so they don't have to move um and uh there's nothing there's nothing wrong with getting a job at one of those companies it's just yeah. that that I, um, I, you know, it's just not it's, what I want to do right now. It's not my style, you know. Not yeah, right and now. and yeah. you know, and you hear more, <clears throat> more and more with each passing day of developers at high-profile companies leaving to start their own studios. Like you know, oh, we're former, you know, God of War developers are gonna take a chunk of us. Say, all right, we've learned enough. It's been real. It's been great. We love you guys, but now. We're doing our own thing. Like, look at the guys who are doing the um, what was that game? Callisto Protocol, the Dead Space creators. You know, we oh, learned a lot, right. and now it's like now we're gonna be our own thing, be our own team, be independent, and sort of like occupy a new space in the industry, free of like all that stuff that comes along with working under a big label. I mean, it it has its pros and cons for sure. I mean. Mm -hmm. On the indie side, most folks, I feel, when they get in bed with a huge publisher or even a small one, they usually retain a lot of their creative freedom to a certain point. But I think for the most part, they're allowed to be themselves when they're making their games, which is, you know, all that matters in the end. That's still your vision that you're creating. Yeah. I mean, like, we can make weird stuff, too. So it's like we can make a game where you play as a carrot. <laughs> and like, we did that <laughs> and you know like no no studio no major studio is going to do that because they know that they know better it's the marketability of a game <laughs> where you play as a character we've, we've done the research and <laughs> make it but, uh, turn turn into instead of a carrot a dildo that may have some appeal in certain <laughs> markets <laughs> uh. <laughs> yeah i mean for instance i mean one thing 
one theme along all of our games right now is none of them have guns. Oh, well, yeah. We, we, we've done 20 something projects, never once put a gun in something. Yeah. I can remember. I think so, yeah. I don't think we have. Which is unusual, right? Like most games. You would think with, with a, a gun. Where you're playing as a robot, I, I want to kill things as a robot. <laughs> and yet I'm being killed left and right. It seems, it seems, <laughs> it seems very wrong to me. <laughs> it's the te- kickbot is like you die so much in kickbot to teach you what it feels like when you kill people in those other games. It's a it's an emotional is, journey. Is that the core message? <laughs> is that is that the takeaway of kickbot? Like, wow, I have all these years of just slaughtering enemies mindlessly, and now I know what it's like to, to be on the receiving end of torture and pain. Thank you, kickbot. <laughs> Thank you. Well, okay, I gotta ask, what is up with the dabbing? <laughs> Where, so for those so, who don't know, <laughs> explain the dab and and then why the dab. <laughs> well, that started a lot of things that we do start as a joke. And so um, like we've started entire games as a joke before for game jams and stuff, but we just kind of do, we, we don't take things too seriously as a studio. Like we just like what we like and we do funny things. So like the dab started off as a, uh, Kickbot doesn't walk or run or anything. So when you touch the ground, we needed some kind of something, some kind of animation for when Kickbot is standing on the ground. Yeah, we went a surprising long time before we had a level where you could land on a flat surface and not die. It took, you know, I don't know, years before we ended up making a level. And we made ended up making a level, a couple levels where there were flat things that you could mm-hmm. land on. Like there's an oil slick that you could slide across. And yeah. Then, we started adding those as part of the our like mechanics where you could slide across certain things and it's like well what happens if you're just standing there what animation do we play yeah so uh, we were just hanging out here at warp zone one night we have a thing called indie tuesday where we hang out and everybody works on their games and we chat and stuff and eat snacks and uh i was just i think it was just a joke like what if it what if kickbutt does a dab when you when as the idle animation. So I made the animation real quick and uh, it was supposed to just be a joke that I would like show to Eric and then we would laugh and then we would do something else. But everybody in the room liked it and was thought it was funny. And then we just kept it and streamers and everybody, like when they see that they just freak out. So it's gotta stay in the game. Like that's just, <laughs> that's, that's what happens now. <laughs> yeah, we haven't thought of anything better yet. Yeah, so I went back and improved the animation a little bit. <laughs> it's so good. So. I yeah. feel I feel like it's again, I know that it, it's hard to be mad at a game that is that has that level of charm. It's like it's I feel like you're you're playing alongside me and like it's like a little subtle wink, like Andy, come on, like you got this. You're a little <laughs> dab. You're doing all right. It's 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 not that serious. <laughs> yeah, you gotta dab for good luck whenever you can. It's uh <laughs> It's, it's maybe kickbutt's powered by dabs. I don't know. <laughs> I love how yeah. as I as I was playing the game, I was thinking, um, like, oh, it's like I'm playing a bit of portal, like I'm being put through all these tests by some grueling AI, and then I see actual portals. I'm like, God damn it, this is just yeah. <laughs> this is just this is just too, too good. <laughs> like it knows where my mind is going before it gets there. Yeah, we started off, um, we did a, our community here in Louisville does a thing called the six hour spooky jam and we do it before oh, Halloween this. every year. Mm-hmm. And so usually we'll make a new game just, just based on like Halloween theme, just come up with something. And it's usually something super tiny because you only have six hours, but we decided to, because we got to finish our game and get it out there. We decided to work on Kickbot during the six hour jam. And um, I think you had the idea based on like the ghost houses in mario when you go through the doors they take you to different rooms Mm -hmm. and um then that eventually we thought about i remember i mentioned like in the movie the fly there's the teleporters and then it eventually like the art became portals from portal because it's something that people immediately understand and we even did the same colors because it's something that people just get and it's a great game that we love so oh my god there's lots of stuff i mean like we're both me and alex are like similar age we're like late 30s or whatever and we've played like we have a lot of the same 
like we'd like a lot of that 16-bit era stuff you know yeah. yeah and like kind of game boy advance or super nintendo or genesis and that kind of stuff so we put a lot of that kind of stuff into the in the kick bot because we just we just love that stuff yeah if there's a <clears throat> if there's a mechanic that we liked or something from from any of those old games like if we put it in the game people will people who also enjoy those games will recognize it and nobody has told us yet like oh you have a thing a grumpster and your game looks like a thwomp and that's a ripoff and you should shouldn't have it they they always just say like oh it's like a thwomp and they laugh and they like it or like we have these things in the game called eaters Mm -hmm. and they're like the uh cannons or the barrels in donkey kong country right yeah yeah and it's like when people see that they're like oh sweet donkey kong country you know it's like they get the little nods to the games that we like in there and they everybody seems to be happy with that and it's like it's like uh i'm just gonna throw that stuff in like the ground pound when 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 we wanted to do the butt stomp or the ground pound or whatever i I was thinking back to yoshi's island i liked how it how the animation worked on that where yoshi would like spin around and it would make like a Uh crank crank kind of sound and then you would drop (laughs) and so i just did that so it's a little nod to this game that i loved that's like such a that's like such a revelation to when you get that little the little butt stop move because it's you know you're playing for a bit and you think you have no direct control over what kickbox can do then it's like you don't but then this comes in play and then you know the gameplay opens up like remarkably at that point it's just it's it's a it's a good sign of really great game design those like aha moments when you're playing so kudos to that because i i know I, I i know what that thing is supposed to do <laughs> Yeah, and then when people figure out that they can cancel out of it, and yep. then that lets them get just at the right height for the whatever they want to do, and and it's uh, yeah, it's 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 fun. Um, We've tried to work really hard to teach people the mechanics through the levels, and not have to have a tutorial. You know, not have there's we want to have as few words as possible in the yep. game. Yeah, that's how you know that you were, that you were brought up playing classic games because those games they didn't have any cartridge space to squeeze a tutorial and how to play the freaking thing so you had to teach through level design and yeah. i think that's that's one of the things that this game it really it, it should it shows you uh, here's a new mechanic here's a little thing and then here's a level for you to play test it on and then you can take it like out in the wild in the next level as you're like yeah. evolving, maturing, and like learning more of the game, how it functions. And that it's like a hallmark of what makes really good game design teaching through playing and not by telling, in a sense. Yeah. yeah. There's, there's like, there's types of games where the character gets more powerful over time and you get a lot of upgrades and add ons and stuff. It's, it's kind of like Metroid. You know, I like that game a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's other types of games where, you the human being get better at the game over time and the character's the same at the end of the game as he was at the beginning of the game we'll see if i get better over time (laughs) i guarantee you will if you keep trying (laughs) a lot of people when they start out the demo like like i see people take anywhere from like 20 to 45 minutes to to get through the demo and Mm -hmm. uh the second time that they play through it sometimes it's like 10 minutes okay it's like pretty good pretty quick yeah and um you know there's there have been very few people that have that have tried the demo and haven't been able to to get through it all it it happens sometimes but i mean it is on it is a platform that's on the the hard platformer side you know like it's a it's a difficult game but right but it it never has that i I never want to give up because it, it satisfies that it's such a rapid fire it's okay one more try i know what i have to do just get better at doing the thing you have to do or yeah. i'll try a different approach with the jumps and like where i want to dismount and etc so I, I i never wanted to quit out of frustration i think that that would mean something is wrong on the design side. i feel like okay, the game is working against me but one of the like core design pillars about kickbot is that you're always in motion you're always mm-hmm. moving yeah. and there's never a pause and it's like you just keep going and trying and mm-hmm. trying i hate games where there's like a loading screen after you die or 
you have to reset way far back or whatever. And it's just like, we just want you to keep going and you enter this flow state of just automatically mm-hmm. playing and it just happens, you know? Yeah. Let me ask you, when you have these little gaming dev meetups with all these snacks and what have you, is there room for like a guy to just like be in the background with absolutely no game design knowledge, can't draw for shit, but he's like, he's a good idea guy. I could be that guy. Sure. I could be like bring snacks. Yeah, yeah. I could be yeah, like, he, you know, the the snacks, sure. <laughs> I could be the snack guy and like walks around and be like, you know what? More spikes here. What if what, what what if the spikes did this? And you'd be like, oh yeah, good idea, snack guy. We'll, we'll take it to consideration. Can I get some more Cheetos, please? <laughs> We can always uh, always use play testers. That's that's always oh, a super super helpful thing. Like, um, uh, but also <laughs> I I kind of feel like anybody can get involved in a game jam if you if you don't have any experience or skills or whatever. You could uh, you could still make a game with uh, something like Twine or or mm-hmm. a lot of these engines that are, like let you do um, stuff without programming, and you could come up with like choose your own adventure stories and stuff where right. you, where um like there there's a lot of a lot of tools out there that are really cool for that but um you know, like at our events and stuff um we used to before covid we would do um a, a play test night where we'd have people come out and uh you know families would come and bring their kids and there would be other people in the community who were like supportive of the people making games and they're not doing it themselves and stuff and they would come out and play what everybody's been working on and we stand in the back taking notes on our clipboard and not telling you anything um about how to play and just seeing how how it works and those are super helpful for people when they're starting out making games because a lot of times you're you're the only person looking at a project for a while in the beginning and uh, you have no idea that when you hand it to somebody they're they're not going to know that the b button does whatever it's supposed to do they have no clue and so it lets you uh, figure out the uh, onboarding in your, to your game and all that and get that really refined. Um, so those are super helpful. Um, On- and, and we, uh, we kind of do that with, uh, with, I mean, we did that before the pandemic and now it would be kind of hard to get that started now. I guess you'd just share it on Discord and stuff. Mm-hmm. On the know of starting out and, you know, being a part of this crazy thing we call game development. Um, you guys mentioned how you, you know, you love your 16 bit era right. games, SNES, and then releasing a game on console is like a dream of yours. What got you into from playing games to making games? What, what was the point that you crossed that threshold into from gamer to game developer? You, you did that pretty early. I mean, that was like one of the reasons I wanted to learn computers and Mm -hmm. programming and stuff was just video games when I was really young. So I started at like 10 years old with some hand-me-down stuff from my uncle. Yeah, you were definitely encouraged. I was was discouraged. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, I got like some old text-based computers, you know, they only had text on them and a a floppy disk with basic on it and they, there was a manual that had like a slot machine program and it was like you just literally just type this thing in and then you could hit the button the run button and play it and i was like well i want more money and then you start hacking <laughs> it to like give yourself more money you know can you remember that just when, they, down the rip. when buying a computer it would also teach you how to code a little bit when you bought a home pc back in the day that idea is not I've lost. heard about that those yeah little, my yeah my first computer was in 95 so that was that was kind of over they had like all the software came with the computer on cd-rom by the time i got a computer but um yeah so i didn't really pick up on the programming side but i had two parents that were artists or mm-hmm. still are and so i was always encouraged like my parents would uh roll out a giant roll of of like butcher paper on the floor and give me a bunch of crayons and I would draw and do stuff and like since I was really little so I was just I've just always been doing art and um, I got my first game system was a Super Nintendo and I got Super Mario World 
and uh, I was just always curious about who made that stuff. Um, it wasn't really until like high school when I started <clears throat> trying to actually make games, and I, I, um, I think I got a copy of Macromedia Flash from my dad's work or something, because um, he did graphic design, and I think it was on one of the computers. Um, and I uh, started learning how to do Flash stuff. I think that there were like magazines that would sometimes have like guides on how to do things with it or something. I think that's probably how I learned. And then um, I would make Flash movies and put stuff on Newgrounds and watch a bunch of stuff on Newgrounds and play games on there in mm -hmm. like the early 2000s. And I tried to make some games like there was like a Space Invaders game that I that I that I copied and from from somewhere and I changed all the art to make it Bill Gates and you're destroying DLL files in the computer and <laughs> stupid stuff like that. <laughs> and, um, and then I, I wanted to go to Art Institute, which is a school there that they had a, a 3D, um, a 3D animation program uh, there that was taught by somebody who worked at Pixar. And oh, wow. um, my, my grades weren't good enough and I didn't have the money to go there. Um, so I ended up just like working and then worked for a while and then years later i saw indie game the movie and it kind of got me like interested in pursuing it again i'll do it um so that was like in 2012 and then i was like oh there are teams of one or two people doing this i could do this i just have to like start learning and so like that night i started trying to learn how to do javascript because i could already do some art stuff so i wanted to learn the code side so i could do both and then shortly after that i met eric and you were you were at a at a meetup a javascript meetup that, uh, that we were both at and uh you were working on a um a little infinite runner game to try to help teach your brother how to do some programming stuff and it was made it was like boxes like there was a red box that would jump on these gray boxes that were buildings and i was like i could do some art for that and uh and that's how we got started i started making like we tried to come up with a theme for the game instead of just a person running on buildings like like cannibal we wanted it to be something different so i mean we came up with a, a cockroach running along uh, grocery store shelves and then that game you can play that game on our website it's uh, it's called scurry <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, that was our first game and that was like in 20 late 2013 something like that and we've been making stuff since then Living the dream, you guys. I love it. Living <laughs> the To get started, you have Google. We didn't have Google. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so let's just go Google shit. Come on. I mean, don't be afraid, you know? Yeah, I feel like, I mean, yes. I'm the same way. I, I was like trying to learn like Adobe Premiere. I'm like, how do I do this transition? How do I do this effect? Just, I just type it into YouTube. It's, yeah. It just spits yeah. out like the answer. I mean. I'm just replicating and not really learning how the system works, but still, the You'll the, pick it up the result, yeah, copying. the yeah, the result is still the same in the end. Um, yeah, if if anybody wants to get started, if you've got access to a computer, that's really the only barrier. Like, mm -hmm. if you get access to a computer, um, then you could get on YouTube and do tutorials and for whatever engine that you're interested in or learn how to do stuff. It's uh, it's easier than it used to be. Um, you just have to be stubborn. Yeah. <laughs> just practice being stubborn, really. Yeah. Yeah. Sticking, I'm, not, I'm like, I'm halfway there. <laughs> sticking, <laughs> sticking with something for eight years. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. with, uh, with people, with people asking, you know, asking like, oh, is that a, you know, is that going to make money if you do that? And you're like, uh, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. Being able to stick with that is, uh, is good. And having people that support you. Like my partner supports me and she always, you know, has always been encouraging. And, you know, I've got Eric and we both, you know, keep each other going uh, with like, I, I want to, you know, we got to get this game done. So when one of us is bored working on something else, we kind of wrangle each other back to keep, keep working on it. I do highly recommend uh, having a game dev buddy because yeah, having that like back and forth, it's kind of like an exercise buddy when you're working out. You yeah, know? Nice. yeah. Of course you get out of bed in the morning and do the day thing. When I was working on games by myself for like the less than a year before I met Eric, um, I had started like three or four different projects and gotten like one level of a game made or whatever, and then I moved on to something else and. Um, 
my the game jam that we both did together in 2014 was the first thing that I actually finished. Like this is a complete game. It's really tiny, but it's a complete game. Like somebody could play it start to finish. And finishing things makes makes for me is really motivating because uh, it's like, yeah, I got this done and I can, you know, I could do things. I'm actually capable. <laughs> so it's reassuring. What what uh, do you what do you guys think is one of the lesser known challenges about being an indie game developer because you know you can talk about budgets and marketing and resources but what is something that you guys face throughout your day while you're making games that isn't really spoken about a lot of um or there's not enough awareness around in like the indie game development scene well i think i you mentioned marketing already and that was my number one thing Mm -hmm. because it's like it's like um, as much as people now, I think, are in the indie scene are aware of it. Mm-hmm. You can't you can't just make a game and have the game be good and put it out, and that's it. And people come and see it. Like getting you, you know, there's so many games coming out that there's uh, the good stuff doesn't always rise to the top without yeah. help. And so, marketing is the is the thing that's, you know, when you're you know, a year or so into your three-year project or whatever, you start thinking about that. And it's like, this is really tough. And this has nothing to do with game development. It's just this yeah. extra thing that I have to do because if I don't do it, nobody's going to know that this game even exists. Like you said, like you had no idea that Kickbot existed yeah. until you saw it on Twitter or something. Yeah, it was a retweet from a developer I'd spoken to years ago. And I, and cool. I, tr- I, I trust their judgment. I'm like, okay, let's see what he's talking about. Yeah, what he's getting all excited about. I'm like, oh, this game, like, it checks all the boxes. Like, it's <laughs> retro, pixelated, like, platformer. It's a little bit of a twist. Like, I was like, again, how did this get past me? But there's, again, there's just so much. There's so many games out there to keep you lose track. Yeah, and, I mean, uh, we're I'm, I'm I'm pounding Twitter pretty hard a couple hours at least every day, like trying to just find people that might be interested in the game and reach out to them and ask them to try the demo and all that stuff. And it's, uh, it's a lot of time. Um, and well, that's something that I think is, re- it's probably really tempting for people to get publishers to do that. Yeah. Um, but we're, um, yeah, trying to do it on our own and see how it goes uh, for a while now. And so um, we're really trying to get 10,000 wish lists on steam. That's a big goal that we have. Um because I've heard that the way the Steam wishlist stuff works is that if you have uh, if you have enough wishlists, then it lets the Steam algorithm know that the game is something that people want. So then it's mm-hmm. more likely to get featured when, when on launch day, launch week, whatever. Mm-hmm. And if you don't have a feature spot, it's uh, there's a, I mean there's a quote from from any game the movie where where Tommy Refinis is like if you're not if you don't have a feature, it's like going into a, a store and asking for a game that they have in the back because it's not on the shelf oh wow yeah and so it's like if, if somebody has to type in kickbot on launch day then we're not going to do that well <laughs> right now is that an arbitrary number the 10k or is that something you've heard like is like a, a good goal to hit in terms of wish list for steam like to, I, to, to push I've, it closer to that feature i yeah i've day. heard that i've heard that opportunities open up if you have 10,000 wish lists or more that's what I've heard from from people so I don't it's not like an official thing that Steam told us or anything it's just something that I've heard people talking about and it's it's like um just some some like marketing discords and stuff that I'm on where people talk about that like you can see a correlation between oh we have this many wish lists so that when the game came out it's kind of like emailing all those people because they're going to get a message that says hey this game that you're interested in came out and if they didn't get that message then they didn't they might not know about it and mm-hmm. so it's like how many games do you know come out on steam all the time and we don't know about them or like even like how many things have you know have you got on steam that you never played or whatever like it's just a ton of you know it's yep. it's a way for us to ping people and say like hey hey remember kickbot so right we need we need more are, more of those are you guys planning to launch on pc and console simultaneously is that the game plan for kickbot we'll see okay we'll see 
we can't we can't say anything about that. We are definitely going to come out on Steam uh, before the end of this year. That's the goal. okay. All right, because I wanted yeah. to ask what the support looks like on the console space side of things. Yeah, it's a there's there's um, as far as I know, there's not a wish list type thing for consoles. Mm -hmm. There might be one on Xbox, but I don't know. I'm not really super familiar with it. But there's a, on the Switch, there's a favorite thing. Mm -hmm. Oh. Yeah, uh, but I don't know what it does. I think it just is a <laughs> list that reminds you, like you can look at once in a while. I don't think it pings you when the game comes out. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Steam has the Steam has the whole keeping people in the ecosystem thing down pretty well. Yeah, I feel so. like every time a new, one of my games on the wish list comes out, I feel like I get like twenty alerts on my phone. Like, all right, I'll, I'll buy it. I get it. I know I wanted it. Like, uh, the game you wanted is out. Great. Perfect. Thank you. And it lets you know when it's on sale. Exactly. Too, yes. And... Yes. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. So one last thing before we move on to rapid fire um, to ask you guys. When folks are playing Kickbot, what do you want the main takeaway to be? I've played it for, you know, I've had a full lovely session with the game. And I put it down for the night. How should I feel? What should I be thinking about when I step away from playing Kickbot? Besides where to send the fire bombs. <laughs> <laughs> well, I like I like what you mentioned earlier about that flow state, about like feeling like you know you're in the zone and you're 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 doing you know you're you're kind of. Um, you're playing, you're hitting the two buttons and you're not like, you're kind of zoned in, but you're not really like thinking about too much. You're just kind of like flowing through the levels and stuff. And that's kind of like, I don't know, it's kind of like an exhilarating feeling kind of a thing. Like, like, whoa, you know? Well, well I want you to have the feeling that you started playing this game that was hard and okay. it mm -hmm. was really hard, but you got better at it. There you go, yeah. that's it. Mm -hmm. I love that. That's for sure the what the what what I've yeah I, I thought of that. I that's why you got him, you know. Yeah, that's why that's why you're a team. <laughs> um definitely yeah, this is gonna look so good when like speedrunners get their hands on it too, because I feel like it's ripe for the speedrunning community. Like yeah, yeah. there's gonna be like we, a like an awesome to... games done quick, and this will be like that's gotta be featured at some point. I hope. We, we tried to I track down that. and talk to a lot of speedrunners and try to make sure that we build in things that are going to help them make them want to play the game. Mm -hmm. Yep, I have uh, I have like reached out to speedrunners to to play the demo and give us feedback. We've had speedrun competitions like tournaments at shows that I've been to with prizes and stuff, and then those people are on our Discord and they they share times for different levels or times for completing the demo. Uh -huh. uh, which are pretty wild if you if you get through the if you get through the demo and you think your time is decent um you might not want to look at the times on the discord <laughs> right <laughs> <'Cause> <laughs> people, i mean people have beaten us a long time ago um and then uh we've made changes and added features to to that are helpful for speedrunners like timers and stuff and we plan to like I've emailed speedrunners and asked them like what are the best what you know what what games are best for best at speed running features wise and mm -hmm. stuff like that and gotten feedback and we want to try to make that easy for people as uh it's uh i've seen a lot of games where people love the game but they have to use their own tools and things to uh to to help with the speed runs to, to like time it and stuff and we want all that to be handled by the game so it's easy yeah so get get, get a frame counter <laughs> in there alongside the death counter <laughs> um all right guys it's been great talking about your game talking about your backstory of how you got into game design and kickbots origins but now it's time for some rapid fire questions a little more about right. you too as awesome human beings okay so two scoop games that's your company name alex if eric were an ice cream flavor now just just think about it now now what, now what his favorite flavor is if he if you were to taste him and he would be an ice cream flavor what flavor would he taste like 
Maybe and er- like, uh, and Eric, I'm gonna ask you next, so think think about it for Alex. I think like a <laughs> like a um like a salted caramel mm. or something because he's uh he's sweet. You know, he's the type of person who who will see a bunny what in the middle of us talking and be like, Oh, it's a bunny, oh it's so cute. Uh <laughs> in the middle of a conversation. Um he's Most he's wholesome he's people I've ever yeah. talked to. <laughs> He's in love with his with his cat Red, and he talks about his little boy all the time. Um, but the salty is because he's uh, he swears like a sailor. There it is, yeah. He's uh, he uh, he has uh, you know little insults and things that he says jokingly all the time that are that are <laughs> a little a little uh, a little too R rated and, and right. things like that. So there's definitely the saltiness there too. So he's got both. <laughs> okay, Eric. If Alex were an ice cream flavor, if you were to taste him, what would he taste like? Oh my god, I don't think I come up with like, as thoughtful of an answer. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> I saw your face. You were like, "Oh my god, this answer is like poetic," and I'm gonna be like, <laughs> you know, vanilla bean because he's white. Like, <laughs> um, jeez. You're not gonna get too deep into it, you know. Just what comes to mind. Yeah, I, mean, I guess I would say mint because he's he likes the mint color Ooh. a lot, and everything around him is mint. And there's there he's a, a trail of mintiness everywhere. Mm-hmm. Backpack. Um, I, I was trying. I was, I was trying to think of a Fresh. like a DIY kind of ice cream. Oh, flavor, like one of those like <laughs> seasonal, like uh, limited time only edition flavors that come like once yeah, around I mean, every now and then cold stone is kind of diy like they have to put all the things together he, he's kind of more like ice cream you would make at home <laughs> i've tried that a few times unsuccessfully <laughs> yeah, it's like mm, ice, cream. ice milk <laughs> yeah ice cream i made at home like i have an ice cream maker that that we got for some reason and it it comes out like runny every time so i'm real i'm, I'm runny yeah, I tried that shit by hand one time. Like, okay, I'll just do it by hand. Take it out of the freezer, pull it out, like mix it, put it back in, rinse, and repeat. It was literally just icy milk. Real hard to with do. Like, with like chocolate chip chunks in it. It's like, this is terrible. You still like, ate it though, right? I did. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, you me know, <laughs> I, I didn't say I was without shame. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm all shame. <laughs> Even bad ice cream is better than no ice cream. It's you know, true. I yeah. I always strive for a quote during the interview. <laughs> that is that is the one <laughs> that is the quote of the show um eric if you got a phone call in the middle of the night saying that alex was arrested what crime did he commit oh definitely like uh like defacing some like corporate thing or <laughs> Man. Pro- protesting for some kind of social justice cause or something. Man, you must love Fight Club. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and Alex, same question. Oh wow, um, man, it's it's uh, you know, it's probably he'd probably get in trouble for for uh, stealing stealing someone's cat and treating it better than they did. <laughs> Oh man, Your Honor, I'm giving it a much better life. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yep. She was so matted; she hadn't been groomed. Her nails were out of control. And then I came it's along. <laughs> it's a true, truer story than you think. <laughs> oh my God, have you kidnapped cats before? It's not just exactly. one. <laughs> <laughs> it's way better with him. Don't worry. Um. We we uh, stood on top of uh, on top of a building down down here on on uh, at our old office space and we weren't supposed to. That was uh, and we took an illegal selfie on the roof, which is pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> and an illegal selfie. Yeah. <laughs> well, the being on the roof was illegal, but the selfie wasn't. Oh my out, God, that sounds like know. the most Evidence. like. What is it, Generation Z? <laughs> Whatever, whatever is like the younger kids now that I, yeah. I, I that I can't stand. It's like, it's like that's like their crime. Your or Honor, think, she's got an illegal selfie. 
<laughs> or I think maybe Eric would get arrested as part of a an a uh, illegal Beyblade modding community. <laughs> like you put knives and razor blades and stuff on them and have them fight each other. <laughs> Hardcore Beyblades. <laughs> That is, I think you should pursue that as a game jam project at some point. Just like an M-rated Beyblade game. If you're ever bored, you can search for Bay- Beyblade oh, it- mods on YouTube. Oh boy. <laughs> razor blades end up in walls and stuff. It's pretty oh, intense. Oh my goodness. <laughs> um, Alex, if Eric were a pro wrestler, what would his name be? <laughs> um... He had a nickname of Clydesdale when we both worked in the same office because he would stomp through the office oh, real loud because he walked so fast. I like that. So. I walk with purpose. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know where the hell I'm going. When I'm mm-hmm. going. <laughs> yeah, maybe so maybe uh maybe Clyde's maybe um he also does this does this like power up move where he kind of he kind of spreads his legs and and like hunches down and like charges up and goes Ugh! So maybe he could be like the man spreader. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. I think name. both of those things sound really good. <laughs> and Eric, what would Alex's wrestler name be? Uh probably Baratunde. <laughs> okay. We need we need, we need to expound on that. <laughs> Please, please explain just, yourself. <laughs> uh, we, we just, we bullshit make up words a lot. So Isn't that we're great? hanging out. Yeah, we just make up words all the time. And, you know, you hear something wrong and then you, so then you start saying it wrong and start expanding on what it might mean. Uh-huh. And, and then start using it in sentences like it actually means a thing. And it gets it funnier and funnier the more you do it. Yeah. So like... tuned is one of those words. <laughs> Does it have a meaning? Can you use it in a sentence? <laughs> what is the country of origin? <laughs> it is It is a country, I think. <laughs> oh, it is? Okay. <laughs> it's the nation of Baratunde. Yes, yes. <laughs> Love it's it. In, it's in lower America. See, this is why you guys are making games, because that's like what siblings do. My brother <laughs> and I have like a whole other language, and my fiance, he's like, what the fuck are they even saying? <laughs> He's like, why when the phone rings, can't you just say hello, hi, like a human being? There's always like some weird word you say. And I'm like, yeah, because it's my older brother. It's like, it's part of the love that we feel and the stupidity that's wrapped in that love <laughs> on every level. Right. Um, <clears throat> would you rather have the power of flight or invisibility, Alex? I have. So, so it's like invisibility sounds cool, but there's no way you could say invisibility without people thinking you're a creeper. Mm-hmm. So I think, uh, I think flight, I go with flight. Mm. Yeah, I don't want people to think I'm a creeper. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's too late. You're on the podcast. All right, Eric. <laughs> I mean, I'm fine with people thinking I'm a creeper, but flight sounds more fun. <laughs> True. Yeah. <laughs> see that, see, I accept that answer. Cause I feel like I would go for invisibility. But, you know, the stigma, I don't give a fuck about stigma. Like, I'm not going to rob you or, like, watch you in the shower. (laughs) I have better things to do. (laughs) Um, I'd rather just be able to, like, go somewhere and avoid traffic, you know? Right, yeah. When you're invisible, you still have to sit in traffic. (laughs) And not have people ask you if you need help when you're in the store, Mm -hmm. when you're in the electronic store, hardware store, whatever. Um, My my partner has has a variation on this question where it's, it's invisibility, flight, or a prehensile tail. And she goes, she says prehensile tail all the way. Wow. So she could have... <laughs> okay. That's that's gonna remain with me for a bit when I hit end meeting. <laughs> <laughs> that's gonna give me like an aneurysm when I'm 60. Thinking about a prehensile <laughs> tail. Like, remember that one time when like Alex's girlfriend was like about a tail? I'm like, yeah. And then Lowe's lead starts, then it's over. <laughs> it's going to sit and fester for 20 years in my back in the back of my head. Um, Eric, what is, if you were given the chance to work on any uh, video game franchise of your choosing, like we want you to collaborate with us in a new game on this beloved IP. What is that beloved IP? 
Uh, oh. I know it's tough. What, what, what comes to what, mind what, immediately? What's, what's something that like hasn't been explored as much as it can be? Because I feel like all these like beloved series have been done so many times now. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I like. Mm, Maybe like a Zelda game. Mm-hmm. Maybe like a Zelda roguelike would be cool. Holy mm-hmm. shit. Yep. You know, I am like a, like a spin-off that. Zelda, not like a mainline Zelda. Yeah, you could do what they did for what was that? Um Crypt of the Necro Dancer. Oh yeah. 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 You could Hyrule. be a, yeah. of Hyrule. of Hyrule, yeah. You could do that. And do a roguelike Zelda. Millions. See, that's how you make your money, guys. Right there. <laughs> that's the real. That's the real hot money is. Um, Alex, different question, but in in, 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 in <laughs> I yeah, was thinking ahead. Dang. Yeah. <laughs> hey, you know what? Give me, give me your answer. Give me your answer. It's not well, fair. I, give me your I'm answer. Think, I'm thinking of games that haven't been like uh, didn't didn't get sequels or or anything. Mm-hmm. Yeah, sure. Like, mm-hmm. like, like um, uh, I think. Like, well, I guess there were two Loco Roco games, but I like those games. They're not super oh popular. God. There's, um, I like that you play as the world in that game instead of as a character. Like you rotate the entire world around the yeah. characters. <laughs> um, there's a game, uh, uh, Mischief Makers on the Nintendo 64 yep. mm-hmm. that um, I saw an indie game, like spiritual successor kind of thing to it recently that, that was pretty cool. Um, but that game was wacky. I like that. I like I like uh, like I like Mega Man games, but they've been done to death. Like all like everything's been done in Mega Man games. But Mega Man Legends is kind of like oh my God. like the third one never came out, and I really love those games. I'm gonna cry uncontrollably, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Mega Man um, Legends. I I weep. I weep for that <laughs> franchise. It's so goddamn it's so- good. It's like a lot of my friends have never even played those games, and they're they're so different than the other Mega Man games. They're right. Really good. Oh man. F- yeah, f- uh, uh, f- funny and like, sort of like, I may require a therapy side story. The other day, I just threw on at random the soundtrack to Loco Roco because I, I love that oh, yeah. fr- that franchise so much. And I and there's a specific track when it came on. I think it's like the second level soundtrack uh, in Loco Roco. I started to cry uncontrollably and I did not understand why. Huh. And I was like, I don't know what unresolved crap I had that's tied to Loco Roco that's making you want to just ball my eyes out. Were they, I, were they I, happy tears? I don't know. I was <laughs> I, 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 I was I was sick at the time and it was just I was laying in bed. I had COVID. I was, I was hanging oh, out. Dang. Maybe Sorry. maybe in like a feverish state. I was just laying in bed, like, okay, let's hear, hear some. Oh, yeah, this is a good, fun soundtrack. And as it came on, I, I'm getting weepy right now. Like, I started to, like, just, like, someone just died. Like, that was oh, the man. level of tears. I was like, and I couldn't understand. In any case, this is about you and not my dementia and my, and my, uh, <laughs> and my, and, and, and my psychosis. Um, it's good to have emotions. Don't, it is. Don't, I mean, yeah, no, don't I don't, I, 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 yeah. No, I, I I never shy away from like yeah. having a, a good cry. It, it was a good cry, but I was wondering why that was a trigger for me. Like I'm crying. trying to think of that music. It's like it's, it's like, like it's like that kind of upbeat. Like it's real upbeat, and there's little voices, and they have yeah, little language. kids' voices. Yes, they sing in the little kids' voices. Yeah. Have you played this game? I'm gonna show you later. Oh, you gotta don't cry. <laughs> Resist the tears. Um, it's on the PSP, so it's kind yeah. of obscure, a little. Uh, Eric, if you could wipe a game from your memory and play it for the first time oh. all over again, what game would that be? Oh, I would really like to do that with uh, Skyrim. Wow. Uh, not uh, like I've played. So I came to Skyrim really late. Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't play it till it came out on the Nintendo Switch. And I played the Switch version <laughs> like a monster. <laughs> <laughs> but it was fun. I put like 200 hours in on it on the Switch. And it was awesome. 
the reason I want to wipe my memory and replay it is because I want to replay it in VR. It would be so much better if I were to play it the first time in VR. It would be a totally different and better game, but I can't bring myself to replay all those missions again because I've already right. played them all. Right. Interesting choice. Yeah, I feel like yeah, I played that game for the first time on, on 360 and then I love VR to death as a format as like a way to experience games in a fun way, but I can't I can't play that game again, period. <laughs> no matter where it is. Mm-hmm. On you VR have, on, on a toaster, I don't I can't. You don't have five copies of it? I, I think I do. <laughs> <laughs> I think I really do. Um same question for you, Alex. What game? What remains? What remains of Edith Finch? Oh boy, because that that was just uh, the story and everything that happens in that game was just talk so about wild, crying, but, but it, fits of it's, tears. Uh, it's like a you know, play. It's like a play through the story once kind of thing. Um, yeah, that game was really cool. Yeah, I think that that game is like a good a good case for a game doesn't have to be fun. To be a great game yeah because that game or journey like, or journey to yeah. one too journey. that would be really fun to play it again for the first time yeah It'd reliving be... the moment of walking up the icy windy peak at the end of the game to to, to re-experience that i feel that that's a moment that comes along very seldomly in gaming um all right i'm gonna ask you guys one last question before you wrap it up I'm curious to see where this goes. Um, Alex, if Eric calls you and he says, there's been a horrible accident, bring a shovel. (laughs) (laughs) Do you run to your nearest Home Depot or do you tell him you got to call the police? Yeah, I've got like four shovels. Yeah, I, I just <laughs> I just throw them in the car and be there. <laughs> Eric. Yes. If if Alex told you, hey, there there's a there's a corpse. <laughs> Do you say oh, I, I, I'll bring the shovels or I'm calling the police? I would say keep it down. <laughs> Where are you? <laughs> Tell me where you are. And turn off your phone, and then I'll be there. Yeah, I think you guys. I think we're meant to be together. This is just. I feel like I have, I have, I have so few friends that where my answer would be like, "How soon can I get a shovel and meet you?" I think for the most part, I would say. I love you, but this is wrong. You got to call the police. Do what's right. <laughs> Two Scoop Games does not condone Two Scoop murder. Games scooping up that grave. That's what they're doing. <laughs> All right, guys. It's been a lot of fun talking to you this week. Uh, the game is Kickpot. It is amazing. You should all go and wish list it right now. Or we'll scoop up a grave for you at some point. <laughs> um, gentlemen, where can our listeners find more about you, about Kickbot? I'll have all the links in the description, but give us like the social media spiel. Uh, Kickbotgame.com. Mm-hmm. Kickbotgame.com has links to stuff. It's uh, Kickbot Game on Twitter. Um, but uh, yeah, you could do demo.kickbotgame.com and it'll go straight to our Steam page. You could you could get the demo, you could wishlist it. Um, we have a Patreon where if you give us money, we will let you name a level in the game. Um, and we use the money to help with marketing efforts so that people actually see the game. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, we have uh, a Discord discord.gg slash two scoop games uh two scoop games.com has all of our old games we have a ton of free web games that you could play like the game where you play as a carrot or uh or a game where you're a, a chef hat and you have to fight desserts or uh what else dystopian future or um the day the world changed that you just have to see it to believe it <laughs> <laughs> um 
you could also play the old Kickbot, Kickbot Classic. It's free on our website too. And then you can see how much better the new one is. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but yeah. How much do I have to pay you to get a level, to name a level? I'm just, I'm just asking for, for a friend. <laughs> oh, I, I think that I made it, I think it's like 10, 10 bucks a month tier on Patreon will do it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, Pretty sure that was it. That sounds. We've got a couple of them. <laughs> Highly like, doable. Super, super helpful. That's, uh, with, that's within my budget. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> we've got a crazy marketing idea that we're going to do, and we could we could use a little budget for that. Uh, hopefully it works out. <laughs> I love it. All right. Well, thank you both for joining me this week. I had a tons of fun talking about you, talking about this stunningly amazing yet pain in my ass game. That's going to find a nice spot in my rotation when it comes out later this year. God bless the Steam Deck, too, because now I can play it while I'm on the shitter. Um, it works so, great on Steam Deck. So, so, ex- got one. so excited for that. Ooh, awesome. All right, guys. Well, thank you so much. Um, yeah, thanks until, for having us. Yeah, this thank is a you. lot of fun. And until next time, listeners, always be excellent to each other. And when you scoop one grave, you got what is what's the quote go? If you scoop one grave, you gotta scoop two. Something like that. <laughs> <laughs>